Um, I'll say a big thank you to Formation for hosting us. Um, does anyone actually want to give a quick intro for anyone? I don't like Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Formation, uh, our high school company that we're hosting us tonight, which we're really thankful for. Um, as far as I'm aware, they're usually hiring, so it's just good to find somebody from Formation and do their talk to them. There are a lovely bunch of people. Um, so, yeah, big thanks to everyone who the venue and all the deals that we do. There's pizza on there, help yourself if you want any of it. Um, without any further ado, our first talk is going from uh, Stefan, if yeah. I pronounced it correctly, and he's going to be talking, as you can see, about proving theorems in COP. Um, this should be really interesting. I don't know very much about COP, but I'm excited to hear more. So over to Stefan. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay, thanks for coming. I'm, I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, talk is, um, is, my, is my new favorite thing. As of the last maybe three years or so, I've been gaining experience with COC, and I, I think it's just the bee's knees, and I, I'm excited to share with you. I hope that after this talk, you share some of my excitement. Um, so a little bit about me. I, I work at Airbnb. Um, I work on infrastructure for CI. And um, Airbnb does not do a lot of functional programming, sadly. Um, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge of mostly object-oriented languages uh, like Java and Ruby. Um, but I am a functional programmer, and I, you know, I need to get my fix. And so for my side projects, I use uh, Haskell and Car. Um, I use Car for proving theorems, and I use Haskell for writing programs. But uh, as, as we'll see, and you might you might know that this is coming. These activities turn out to be the same, proving theorems and, and programming. Um, that's called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. No more on that later. Um, and the cock is not a toy. Cock is like a, it's a serious tool. I mean, it can be fun like a toy, don't get me wrong. But um, I use this to prove a few um, larger scale theorems, like the soundness of system F, which um, many of you as Haskell programmers probably know that system F is like the uh, the core type theory for Haskell, or like the, the basis for it. Um, I've also proved the, the clinging fixed point theorem, which is um, it's a, a result from domain theory that's used uh, for formalizing the denotational semantics of programming languages. So um, you can see there's a theme here. I, I like to study programming language theory. And um, I've also formalized various bits of category theory. Uh, people will warn you, don't, don't try to formalize category theory in a proof assistant like CAR, because uh, You'll run into all kinds of problems, like because category theorists like to do things like, oh, the, the category of all categories, you know, that forms a category. Um, if you do things like that um, naively, you run into paradoxes. Right? So you've got to make sure that you, you're talking about small categories and large categories of small categories. And you have like a, a hierarchy. And Cock does let you do these things. That it just uh, it takes a bit of effort to get it right. So I, um, the reason I, I like Cock so much is. Um, because I think, for me, logical reasoning is, is actually hard. I'm not very good at it. Um, it seems simple in principle. You start with some assumptions, and you take logical steps, and then you arrive at a conclusion. It should be that simple, right? But um, every, every step of the way, there's some probability that my brain will make a mistake. And uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't even know when I've made a mistake. Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm one of these mathematicians of, of yesteryear, Writing a proof on paper like a barbarian, and uh, you know how do I how can I trust it? How do I know it's right? Because the, the traditional answer would be peer review, uh, but then you know you're just sending it off to other humans who also are fallible. Um, what I really like is to have you know complete confidence that my results are correct. And uh, I think since you all are Haskell programmers, you probably share that. That's why you use Haskell because you like you know strong type safety and things like this. <laughs> so that's what Cock is for me. Uh, Cock is a proof assistant. For me, it's like an extension of my my brain, like an extension of my <laughs> own ability to reason logically. So um, I use this thing all the time. I think it's super fun, but it has a big learning curve. Um, I hope that today we can get over the first hump of that learning curve, um, which is the hardest hump, I think. The biggest thing um, that uh, students, in my experience, struggle with uh, regarding Cock is the name. People. Um, have, they get uncomfortable saying it. Um, I don't know what to do with that. You just gotta, you just gotta grow up because the so cock means rooster in French. It comes from the. Um, what I do is I pronounce it with a French accent. Can you can you tell me how to pronounce it? Cook. Cook. Okay, there you go. Cook. 
You're never in, you know, kind of with this throw everybody off. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't, I didn't know that. It's a French word, right? Yeah, yeah. So it comes from the, the University of Inria, which is, has a tradition of naming their projects after animals. So, rooster. Um, I found that um, writing proofs in Kafka is, is actually very similar to programming, not just in theory, not just this Curry Howard thing, but, but in practice too. So, um, you know, you, you write a large proof, but you don't write it all in one go. You, you break it up into manageable pieces. Um, and in math, we call those lemmas, but in programming, we call them helper functions. It's the same idea. Uh, we, we organize big proofs in, in modules. We split them across files. We can use Git. Uh, we can use version control systems. It's just text files. But we can have a CI system. So you know, when you push code to a branch, um, it runs the cock compiler, and then it, it checks that you don't make any mistakes. So I have, a, I have a GitHub repository that has no bugs in it. Uh, and I'm confident that there are no bugs and that all the math in there is correct. Um, and for me, the, the fact that I can say that is just is so cool. I, I'm just, I think this is the best thing ever. I don't know why more people don't do it. I think it's just, it's the learning curve. And I think um, also the documentation can be sparse at times. Um, you're lucky if you find help on Stack Overflow, um, but it can be rare. So well, I, you can reach out to me on Twitter if you have questions. That's why I'm here. I'll help with that. And also the Curry Howard isomorphism. So, oh, how many of you have heard of this thing before? Curry Howard. Okay, great. <laughs> how many of you could like explain it? Uh, you, okay. Well, basic idea is that um, whenever you write a program, um, you're really writing a proof. Or whenever you write a proof, you're writing a program. And the theorem that you're proving is the type of that program. So that that's called propositions as types. Um, you know, Phil Wadler likes to talk about this a lot, um, the, Haskell, the Haskell guy. Um, so here, here's, here's just to make it more concrete, like if you want to prove like A and B, you know, that's called a conjunction in logic, what do you have to do? Well, you have to provide a proof of A and a proof of B, and then you know A and B. And in programming, that's the same thing as just making a pair. You have um, a pair containing two things, or a proof containing two subgroups, same idea. It works with disjunction too. So. You know, if I want to prove A or B in logic, um, that's the same thing as constructing an either in Haskell. You know, there's like, there's two constructors. I can pick which one. I don't need both. I only need one. Um, this, is, this is kind of the main one. So if you want to prove that A implies B, that's an implication, that's really just a function that takes a proof of A, transforms it into a proof of B. And then we'll, we'll talk uh, a bit more about this one, but I want to prove some, uh, some quantified proposition, like for all x, you know, blah, 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 something of x. Um, so in programming, that's a dependent product. And most programming languages don't have dependent types, um, including Haskell. Haskell doesn't have dependent types yet. Um, there's some work ongoing to, to make that a reality, but it's, it's not landed yet. Um, and it just it goes on and on. So that's the idea of the curry Howard isomorphism. So, Today, um, I wanted to teach you, the, well, we'll start with the basics of Cock. So Cock itself is a purely functional programming language like Haskell. It looks like Haskell, so I'm going to rely on your previous Haskell experience to, to kind of breeze through the syntax, I hope. Um, and we'll spend some time talking about dependent types, um, which is something that we don't have in Haskell. So, um, you know, most of us are probably not used to working with dependent types. Who, who knows about dependent types? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. Most of us. Oh, well, then most of us. I could just skip uh, the first half of the talk. That's good. Um, then, we'll, then we'll talk about how to do like actual proofs in car. Um, so I'm going to kind of build this up from, from an empty universe, like from scratch. Because I think this is why it was so hard for me to learn car. Because all the tutorials will, will tell you, like, you use, uh, use this magical command. You use these tactics to prove things. You don't really know what's going on. Um, and I think for me, at least, like, I like to learn things like this uh, from, from first principles. So that's, that's the approach we're going to take today. Um, and at the very end, I can show you how to, how to take a proof that you've written in Cock and then and proven it correct and then extract it to a Haskell program. And then you can run it with GHC. Uh, that's it. Let's just dive in. Uh, so I, I mentioned that I have this repo that has a bunch of proofs in it. Um, you can check it out. Um, all the code that you're about to see on these slides is in there. Um, so 
Um, you can reference that out of the top. So this is what a, a proof looks like in Kotlin. I don't expect you to, well, maybe you've already exceeded my expectations quite a bit, um, but I don't expect you to be able to totally understand this yet. Um, but this is a simple proof that addition is associative, addition of natural numbers. Uh, so that means that it doesn't matter which way you group the parentheses. Um, yeah, you know what associative means. So that's what a proof looks like. Um, and the, the goal for today is to really so to- can you, can you go back? So what is CBM? Oh, my name. It's a reduction strategy, mm -hmm. lambda calculus. Cock is just a lambda calculus, like Haskell. Okay. So uh, yeah, I can explain a little bit more. Yeah, I don't want to derail your logic, so go on. Basically what's happening here is Cock has this scripting language um, called uh, LTAC, and it's, it's very uh, gross and hacky, and it's dynamically typed. But what it does is it generates proofs which are statically typed, and the Kotlin compiler checks those proofs. So the tactic language is expected to be um, buggy. Um, it's not perfect, but everything that it produces uh, is checked by the core kernel um, against you know, the calculus of inductive construction, which is the, the theory that Kotlin is based on. So you can really trust the proofs. Like if you get to the QED step and then Kotlin accepts it, you know it's right. Assuming that uh, there are no bugs in cock, or there are no bugs in your hardware, or you didn't get hit by a cosmic ray, a CPU, when it was doing the checking, or whatever. You do kind of have to trust a lot of things, but they tend to be pretty reliable. Um, OK, so let's, let's talk about functional programming in cock. Um, so in, inductive data types in cock um, are the way you introduce new types. And um, they're a lot like Gadgets from Haskell, generalized algebraic data types. Um, I think that probably everyone here has seen these before, so this shouldn't be surprising, but here I'm just defining any type to represent Booleans, and there are two constructors, true and false, which are Booleans. All right, so here's a more interesting inductive data type. This type represents natural numbers. So a natural number is either zero or the successor of another natural number. So if your successor is meant to mean like plus one, so I, I have zero or I have like the next natural number or the next next natural number, Etc. So this is how I would construct a natural number. So this is the number three in cock. And in fact, in cock, I can actually just write three, like the, the character three. Um, and it de sugars into that. OK. Um, here's how you write a function. Um, this is a simple function that does pattern matching on a Boolean to flip the Boolean. So if it's true, it becomes false, and false becomes true. Um, it's, it's a lot like what you do in Haskell, but a bit more verbose. So you introduce new definitions with the keyword called definition. And then you give the name of the definition, which here is called not. And then the arguments. So there's an argument of type B. <coughs> Cock has type inference, so it figures out that B is a Boolean. You don't have to annotate it. You will have to annotate things uh, as types become more complex. But for a simple function like this, it, it figures out by unification. All right. <coughs> When you, use a, when you want to define a recursive function, you, you have to use a different keyword called fixed point instead of definition. Um, the, so when you use fixed point, uh, you're allowed to do recursion. So here, I'm, you know, there's a recursive call to add on the fourth line. Um, and cock requires that your function is total, um, meaning that it terminates. The way it uh, checks that is it has to see that one of the arguments, in this case x, is somehow decreasing at every recursive call. So um, if you stare at this for a moment, you'll see that that, that is the case here. So um, x squared pattern matching um, in that second branch, we uh, see that x is a successor of some other number, p, which is smaller. So p stands for predecessor here. And then we recurse with the predecessor instead of x. So of course, it gets smaller and smaller until it gets the base case. That's called well-rounded recursion, or uh, um, uh, yeah, that's called low-bound recursion. So um, Cobb obviously can't solve the halting problem. So it doesn't know, um, given an arbitrary function, it doesn't know for certain in every case whether it halts or not on every input. Um, it uses this simple syntactic check. So in some cases, you know, you'll have a function which definitely terminates, but Cobb doesn't know it. And in that case, you'll have to provide a proof of termination. So for simple things like this, Cobb just figures it out. This also is called primitive recursion, if you know. Um, those things. 
Um, I guess I could do polymorphism cock. This is the polymorphic identity function. It's actually just uh, an ordinary function, and it happens to be that the first argument is a type. So A is a type. And then the second argument, X, is uh, an element of that type. Um, cock doesn't let you be as, um, as um, uh, like in Haskell, you know, the, the syntax is a little bit less verbose, and some things are left implicit. So in cock, all type applications and type abstractions are explicit. Um, so in, in, in Haskell, you just write, you know, id x equals x. Um, Cock doesn't, isn't quite as nice in that regard. However, what you can do is you can make, uh, and by the way, this is how you invoke this identity function. You have to pass it the type first, which is bool in this case. Then you can pass it the, the real argument, which is true. Um, so actually, Cock does let you um, make a an implicit argument. If you, instead of using the parentheses there, you use curly braces. The curly braces. So now it, A is implicit, which means that when you invoke this function, um, Cock will figure out the argument for you. So now you can just say ID true. You don't have to pass the Boolean to the type. Um, that's very convenient. I use that all the time. Any questions about this? Kind of like um, we're relying on Cock's type inference engine to figure out some things for us. Very, very good. Okay, so. You said you are familiar with dependent types, so I guess an example um, is going to be too uh, strenuous for you. But um, here, this is a, I'm defining just a list, but it's a length indexed list, which means that um, the length of the list is tracked in the type. Um, it's called S list because it's a list of string. Um, could have made it a polymorphic list, but I wanted the example to be just as simple as possible. So um, a list, an S list is either uh, S nil. It's like the you know empty list, um, which has length zero. You can see that in the type. Um, or it's a cons um, that for all n, n here is the length of the tail. So it takes a head, which is a string, and then a tail, which is a, another s list of length n. And then uh, what you get is an s list of successor n, n plus one. Um, and at the bottom there, you can see that's an example of constructing one of these lists. <coughs> And you can see I've made the end parameter implicit, an implicit argument. So that way I don't have to, when I'm constructing a list, I don't have to say s cons um, like two hello, s cons one world, s cons, or s nil, uh, s nil doesn't take an end, so I could just end there. But it's nice to not have to say the, the number every time. So that's an implicit argument. Any questions about that? That's just a length index list. This thing is really cool because you know normally in programming languages, you know the, you just have a, a list and you don't know if it's empty or not, and so you know if you try to take the head of the list or something, you know that could blow up in your face. So this is this is quite nice. Um, so here here it gets a little bit. Uh, um, you have to kind of like, I have, well at least when I look at this I have to think about this uh, pretty hard. Um, the type signature though is, is pretty simple. So this is a concat function. It takes two lists. And combine them, right? Um, if you look at the side, the, the, the first list um, has has length n1, the second list has length n2. So the concatenation of those two lists should have length n1 plus n2. And you can see it does. Um, now, in the the body of this function, um, well, I, I assume that you've seen how to concatenate ordinary lists, like in Haskell. Um, and the definition here is exactly that, but we're just doing some extra. Um, Stuff to make sure that the, the indices um, match up and fit together. So uh, yeah, I, can, I can stand up here and explain. Um, so this is the, the general form for a dependent pattern match. Um, pattern matching with dependent types is actually a little bit tricky in some, time, in some cases, um, like this one. So here I'm giving um, a pattern for the return type. So this pattern has to unify um, against the actual return type here. Um, but um, uh, let's see, I have to explain this. So um, N3 here is just N1. Um, but down here, it's uh, 
you see, this is what I mean when I think about this. It's great. <laughs> why, is it, why is the return between match and width that's significant? Or this, all just, this is just one big pattern match. So it's not, this is not like some separate uh, like expression. It's like match in return with n. Is, you need all those things for the in the most general case. And a lot of times you can omit different parts of this. But this is like this is the most complicated pattern match ever. So if you understand this, you really get everything that's going on here. Um, yeah, so basically what, basically what we're doing, we're just telling Cock how to like, um, there's no logic in there. This is just like for Cock to type check it correctly. You have to get these things. Um, now let's see. So we're, we're pattern matching on L1. That's the, that's the first clip. Um, is, is the return line just a type? <laughs> yeah, okay. This, yeah. This is a type. That's a type. So you're saying it's cool. Yeah, so you, you match L1 as an S list of N3, so you're basically pulling out the N the, that the type argument, and then you're saying you're going to return a list of N3 plus N2 and the match that actually does it. Yeah, that's right. So like this N3 gets the length from whatever L1, yeah. L1's length is, which in this case is N1. So N3 is, is uh, N1 here. Why do you need a three then? We can just like one. Yeah. Um, oh, these are good questions, I think. Um, just, just because you want a new, new pattern variable? Or what? So L1 is of type S list and 1. Yeah. So we know what type it is. So this is kind of an introduction of a new type variable. Mm -hmm. So why do I need N3? It's always going to be equal to N1. Um, maybe it's going to be simplified. But I'm just asking. So well, it makes sense to return S list of N1 plus N2. Was part of this showing that the list gets smaller because you have to show that it's total? No, this is not recursive. I mean, oh, you've, recursive. you've type checked this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it seems yeah. to me like N3 is supposed to be the length of L3, in which case, yeah. don't you need something like S list N3 plus 1? L1 has a type S list N3 plus 1. Because you're matching it at the second level of S cons X L3, right? So you're peeling off the head and then you've got the remainder of the list. I don't, I don't think, and because we're going to be returning S list of N3 plus N2, N3 has to be the whole length of the first list, which, yeah, it's kind of weird because you, you, the way it's phrased, you might expect that to be the length of L3, but it's not. It's not? Because otherwise, when you're returning S list N3, plus n2, it wouldn't match right. the expected right. return type, which is s list n1 plus n2. So how come n2 is there, but n1 is not? Yeah, so I think that we're saying is that we've introduced a new type variable n3, which is the same as n1, and I wonder if for some reason it can't prove at some point that the match... I think like, it's l1 to the, the a snail s comments x l3 on the bottom. Yeah, so L1 is either be S nail or it'll be S cons XL3. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm just not sure why we need to introduce the extra type, why it can't reuse the existing one. Mm -hmm. Maybe can't, oh, know, I can't I modify it. Well. No, I just, this is my mistake for making the, uh, the lengths implicit here, so it's actually kind of hard to see. But um, you know how, like, in, in, when you pattern match on generalized algebraic data types, you actually learn information that needs to be practiced. Mm -hmm. So here we're learning the length of the tail of um, L, L1, right? Yeah. Which is L3. Um, so then uh, <clears throat> in the, the, the rule for cons, we take basically, um, there's like an associativity thing going on. There. So, so this is the length of L3. Uh, or so I mean, sorry. Uh, this is an L3 of unknown length yet. Wait, is it that? Okay, so um, M3 takes on the value of the, the length of this tail 
I don't think so. And then we can't, so we get, you know, we get the, I don't think that's I don't why we're still, we're still, that's yeah. the case that you need N3 plus one, right? Well, well the yeah. Tom's just that. So the, the type of, so this is like N3 plus N2. Right. And we add plus one for the cons. Right. But in the match L1 in S list N3, as if N3 is one less than N1, then that's not going to match. I mean, I wonder if it's just a, a symptom of the language that when you do the match, that you're required to name that type variable and that you can't reuse the existing one. So, because it's, it's in the to syntactic requirement, because we're inducting on L1, therefore we need to give it a new. Yeah, because if you think, you, if you think when you pattern match, like in Haskell, if you pattern match on a value, you effectively declare names to refer to all the parts in it, mm -hmm. and those parts are all values. Okay. Because this is dependently typed, you also want to capture the name of the types. Like pattern matching, you're not just getting the values inside this thing. So you know, you're using the s nil or the s cons to get the values out, but you're also actually pattern matching on the type. So I'm guessing that that's a syntax to just say, when we match L1, we discover the length N3, even though we've already already said that that's like in the, in the type at the top, like it's probably a requirement that you have to basically match the type and put the type out as well. That would be my guess. Mm. Okay, let's anyway. uh, let's take this offline, and you can just read the cock documentation. <laughs> <on this context. laughs> um, all right, so that's um, yeah, that's that's quite strange. Uh, so okay, let's talk about at this point. I want to switch over to um, to the actual cock IDE. So. Uh, let me zoom in here. This is what, when you download COC, you, um, you have basically two options, as far as I know. You can use this, this COC IDE interface for writing COC code, um, or you can use Emacs. Um, there's an Emacs node called Proof of General, which um, implements this same functionality. So I'm going to show you how to use COC IDE. So basically, uh, you write the code in this window on the left. And then um, you can click this button to basically tell COC to Time check up to this point where my cursor was. Um, so normally with programming languages, you, you just send the program to the compiler and it time checks the whole thing all at once. But with Cockit, that would not be very easy to use because you, it's like um, you're, you're interactively proving theorems. And sometimes you haven't written the whole proof yet, you're still like kind of exploring. So you want to just time check up to where you are. So Cock lets you do that. Um, so let's talk about this Curry Howard thing. So, um, I'm going to try to represent uh, propositions, like things that you could prove, as types, right? So um, the idea is that if I can construct a value of that type, then I've proven the proposition. So here's a trivial proposition called true, not to be confused with the Boolean true. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big point of confusion that I think, uh, well, I was certainly confused about this when I first learned Park. Um, this is just another thing called true, which is a proposition which has one constructor it takes no arguments, so you can always construct a value of this type, you, which is another way to say you always have a proof of this proposition. So it's kind of a trivially true proposition. So it's not very useful. Here's another one. So this is false. Um, it has no constructors, so you, you just can't um, instantiate it. Uh, so you, you better not be able to construct a proof of false, or else things would be, uh, things would be bad. I'll make it bigger so you can. I can see it. Um, okay, so um, I mentioned at the beginning that conjunction is really just like a pair. Uh, so this is this witnesses that. So um, a proof of, of P and Q, I've written it in, in prefix notation, and PQ, um, is just a, a proof of P and a proof of Q, and that's it. So there's one constructor, and it takes those two things. It takes uh, this is. P, a proof of P, and then it takes a proof of Q. Um, simply enough, right? So um, one thing I want to do is I want to make the, oh, I should explain. So um, this conjunction, this conj uh, constructor really has, it has four arguments. It has, um, it has these types P and Q, which are the propositions you want to prove. And then it has the proof of P and then the proof of Q. Um, so generally when you write a type like this, it's like if you parameterize the whole type by something like P and Q here, then all the constructors have those as arguments. Um, and that, that turns out to be very annoying. So I'm going to make the, the first two arguments 
implicit. Implicit arguments are our friends, right? So um, all this syntax means is uh, I'm not going to type. I'm not going to explicitly type the the names of the propositions I'm trying to prove. I'm just going to provide the proofs when I want to construct a proof of P and Q. Because you should be able to figure out what P and what Q are based on the proofs of them. Um, here's a simple proof of true and true. Um, so you saw a definition before. That's, that keyword just means I'm, I'm going to define a new thing, like a new variable. Um, so here's a proof. This is the type uh, annotation. I don't have to write the type annotation here, because um, Cock would figure it out. But I do anyway, because I want to know what I'm proving. So I'm proving true and true. And I'm using the constructor conj, the only constructor for conjunction, and passing it uh, a proof of true for p and a proof of true for q. And remember that the proofs of true are just trivial. That's the constructor here at the top. Um, trivial is the proof of true. OK, so proven true and true. That's, that's pretty easy. Um, let's, prove it this, let's prove the same thing again, but this time using the proof mode. So Cock has this kind of interactive proof mode. You never write proofs by hand in Cock. That's just insane. You always use the proof mode because it helps you figure things out interactively. So let's do that this way. So I type uh, proof. So like, you know, before I was like just giving the definition directly with colon equals. Uh, now I'm going to proof mode. So proof mode let me use these tactics. So this, you can see on the right, this panel, um, this is like the goal that I have to prove. I'm in the middle of a proof right now. Um, so I'll apply the, the conj constructor. So there's a tactic called apply. And now I have two, two more goals that I have to prove. So that's, and that's another way of saying that is I, conj takes two arguments and I have to uh, satisfy them. So I'll just, these bullet points uh, with the hyphens allow me to like focus on a particular goal. So I'll focus on the first goal, and then I have to apply the trivial constructor to prove true. And now I have to go to the second goal and do the same thing. OK, so now we've seen two different ways to prove a thing. Um, and we always use the second way, the proof mode. But it is helpful to know um, how to do it this way. It's, it's helpful to know what's going on. Because um, when you do more complicated proofs, um, knowledge of the underlying type theory is very helpful. Uh, so just I can print out. Um, the proof that I've just constructed in, in proof mode, and you can see that it's exactly what I wrote by hand the first time. Um, and then this is another proof of the same exact theorem, but um, I'm using this like semicolon operator here in, in LTAC, and that just means apply this thing to both branches, or all the branches that are generated by the first tactic. So remember, this thing generates two sub goals. And the semicolon means apply that to both of the sub goals. And I get the same proof. OK, so that's, that's very boring. Three ways of proving the same thing. Why would you do that? Let's move on to, um, let's try to prove true and false. Well, I shouldn't be able to do that, right? OK, so let's see what happens. Um, I apply the conj, because I'm proving a conjunction, the conj constructor. So the first case is easy. I just I have to provide a proof of true, which we have. And now I'm stuck. I don't know how to provide a proof of false. So um, OK, that's good. So abort the proof. That didn't work. Um, here's, um, here's how you define if and only if in Cock. It's really just um, you know, p implies q and q implies p. This is, like, um, this is what you learn in, in logic class or whatever. Um, here's how you define or in Cock. This is logical disjunction. Um, so it's kind of like and, but there's two constructors instead of one. Um, so if I want to prove p or q, I just have to prove p and then use this constructor. Or I can prove q and use that constructor. Um, and again, I'm going to set some implicit arguments so I don't have to type the p and q all the time. So here's a proof of true or false. I couldn't prove true and false, but I can prove true or false. Um, so I'm going to prove the left one, which is true. So I'm going to use the tactic called left. You kind of just have to memorize these tactics. It's, it's very um, unenlightening. Um, there's, a, there's a small handful of them. I think I use about 12 of them. But there's like a few hundred, I think. But I only use 12 of them. That's enough to get by. Um, and then trivial proves that goal. So that's very easy. OK, great. What about not? So here's the thing with intuitionistic logic. Um, which is the kind of logic you do when you're using the curry hierarchy isomorphism. 
Um, in, in classical logic, you have things like the law of the excluded middle, where you can say, like, for any proposition p, we have p or not p. You know, it's either true or it's false. It's got to be one of those two things. Um, well, that, it turns out that's not true in intuitionistic logic, which is the kind of logic you do when you do functional programming. Um, but there's another way to define it. So you might wonder, how do you define not at all? Um, and this is how we do it. So basically, if a implies false, well, that would be pretty bad for a, right? So that it must be not a. That's what we say. Is, that's how we define not. So not something means that it implies false. You should never be able to prove that. Um, cool. So um, we can prove not false, though. Um, so let's let's take a look at this. This is this is more practice with practice with tactics. Um, so I want to unfold the definition of not. So I want to like work with it, right? So we'll just do that. Unfold not. Um, that's the, just the definition that I defined a few lines above. Now I have false implies false. Whenever I see uh, an implication like that, that's just a function. So how do I how do I construct a function like this? So one way to do it is I um, I can assume that the I can assume that I have um, the argument a proof of false, which I obviously can't have, but I can assume that I have one and then try to prove the the Conclusion, and so that is the intro tactic. So intro takes that argument and moves it above the line, which means that it's a hypothesis that I'm allowed to use the proof. Okay, so now below the line is the goal. I'm trying to prove false, which I shouldn't be able to do, but I do have a proof of false called H up here. So um, I just I say exact H because exact means like I have exactly the goal, and I just hit Q. -E, and I just type Q. -E. Okay, so. We can take a look at what, what proof we've just constructed. You can always print a proof after you've constructed it. So this proof is a simple function. It takes a proof of false and just returns it. OK, that's not very, not very awesome. Not very interesting. Um, here's, this, is, this is a kind of a tricky one. This is how you define equality in Cock. Equality is actually kind of a contentious subject for, um, for formal uh, proving, theorem proving. Um, who, who's heard of um, homotopy type theory? Okay, well, okay, everybody. So, um, the homotopy type theory takes a different take on equality. Um, but here, this is simple propositional equality, um, which in some sense reifies definitional equality. So, in, in Koch, um, you know, if you have a, a term and you beta reduce it to another term, those are considered equal. Um, like in the, in the proof engine, like completely indistinguishable. Um, so that's like that's called definitional equality. You say those things are because they normalize to the same normal form. So in that sense, that's one way to define equality. Um, here again, I can reify that as like a type. So I can say, um, okay, I'm defining a new type called EQ. Okay, and it's parameterized by. Um, the thing, uh, type called A. So A is the type of the thing that I'm trying to say is equal to another thing. Um, okay. So this X, that's that's the left side of the equality. I'm saying that X is going to be equal to something. Um, and then I have this EQ REPL constructor. So this constructor is a constructs a proof um, of that two things are equal. Um, and of course, it it, um, it doesn't take any arguments other than you know this these two arguments that were on, on the whole type. Um, and here we see that x has to be definitionally equal to x because I've written x twice. That means that you know they're going to be the same, um, or at least definitionally equal. So one might be like you know an application of a, a lambda to some term, and then the other one might be what happens when you beta reduce that. But to cop those are exactly the same thing because they normalize to the same value. And then I'll make a, I'll set that A to be an implicit argument because that's not very interesting. Um, okay, so let's let's construct a proof that um, zero equals zero. So that's that should be easy enough, right? Um, so there's a tactic in COP called reflexivity, which basically just um, calls that constructor. Reflexivity is when you have a thing equal to itself. Um, okay, so it turns out that um, 
the induction principle that you get when you define equality this way is, is equivalent to, it's actually exactly the same as something called Leibniz equality, which is another way to state what equality is. So this is the definition of Leibniz equality. Um, it looks really complicated, but it's not. It's just saying that, um, you know, if x and y are equal, if for any proposition, or for any, for any predicate p, um, p of x implies p of y. Um, and that, you know, that's quantified over any predicate p. Uh, so basically, x and y are indistinguishable because I can choose any predicate and, you know, those predicates can't tell the difference between x and y. So we say x and y are equal. Um, okay, so by the way, check is like, tell me the type of this thing. It's like uh, in, in GHCI, if you type colon t, that's the same thing. And it, it prints it in the bottom right pane. So that's what the bottom right pane is for. I think I forgot to explain that, but it's just for like printing information about the state of the world. So um, the point of this whole thing is that Leibniz equality is the same as the induction principle for this um, equality type that I defined, oppositional equality. And they, it prints the same thing when I, when I ask for the type of these two different definitions, it gives me the same type, so that's it. Okay, um, so this, so this is just, um, so we, we've seen universal quantification, like, you know, for all, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's built into Croc. That's like a, that's called a dependent product type. Um, one thing that's not built into Croc is existential quantification, which is kind of like the, the dual to universal quantification. And the reason why is because it turns out you can just define it yourself. Um, you know, if you define a type like this, um, so this is, uh, to construct a, a proof of this thing, I need uh, uh, some some x, which is just you know anything of type a, and then a predicate, um, and a proof that that predicate holds for x. So, you know this this constructor basically takes two arguments: it takes x and it takes the proof of p of x, and then I can pattern match on this thing later to get the proof out, the proof of p of x. So this is like you know I'm saying there exists an x such that p of x. Um, that's how you define. Uh, existential quantification. Then here's a simple proof uh, that there exists some value which is equal to itself. Um, that's a, uh, and I, I just picked zero arbitrarily, but anything would have worked here. Okay. Um, so that's like how you encode logic in a dependently typed programming language. Um, so let's do some like more, you know, some some more mathy proofs, some real proofs. Uh, Okay, so let's say I wanted to prove that um, zero plus n equals n for any n, for any natural number. Um, so you can see the proof uh, state on the right, that's the goal I need to prove. I'm going to use intro to move the n um, above the line, which basically means I'm going to assume that there's some arbitrary n. I don't know anything about it. If I can prove it for that n, then I've proven it for all n. That's how you prove uh, for all. Okay, so I have some n, which is natural number, and I need to prove that zero plus n equals n. Um, so I'll use this thing. So you asked earlier, what is CBN? CBN stands for call by name. Um, it's a way to reduce expressions in car. Um, it, it's also the, it's like the evaluation strategy used by Haskell, uh, kind of. Um, as, you know, as opposed to call by value, which is where you evaluate the arguments first and then you pass to the function. <coughs> okay, so call by name is what I'm gonna do here, which basically will pass, uh, zero and n into that addition function that I defined earlier. And what happens when, when we do that? Oh, the zero went away. Um, and if you recall how we defined addition, that makes sense because um, in the first case, um, you know, if we have zero, then we just return the second argument. And we, the zero just disappears. So this is true by reflexivity, so we're done. <clears throat> okay, so we proved that zero plus n equals n. Now something interesting tries to, it happens when we try to prove it the other way. N plus zero equals N. So let's, let's take a look there. So, uh, okay, so we'll try the same thing. Intro to bring the N above the line. And then call my name to reduce it. But uh-oh, nothing happened. Um, it doesn't reduce. Why not? Does anyone know why? Because we <laughs> use the inductive definitions. I think, I think you both said the right thing, yeah. Um, because if you 
So anyway, this proof isn't going to work. Um, let's look at how add is defined. Um, this is how we defined it. So basically, we're pattern matching on the first argument. Um, so that's why it worked in the first group, because the first argument was zero. So we're in this case. Um, that was very nice and easy. But now we're in this case. Um, that doesn't really help us. So the, answer, the, the way to prove this is we, we need to use a proof by induction. Um, OK, so whenever you define an inductive data type, Koch very graciously generates an induction principle for you automatically. Um, this is something you could write yourself just by pattern matching on the, the type you just defined. But Koch uh, is very nice and does it for you. So um, for natural numbers, when we define natural numbers, we got this for free. Called nat in, which is the induction principle for natural numbers. You may remember from uh, like college that induction is like when you say, um, you know, I, um, if the, the predicate is true for the base case, and then if I assume it's true for some arbitrary n, and I can prove that it's true for the successor of that n, then I can conclude it's true for any n. For all n, it's true. Um, that's what this thing is, is stating on the right. Um, oh, and I put it in a comment there too. If this one's easier to read. So um, if one proves that some predicate is true for all n, I just have to prove it's true for the base case, and then it holds when you, um, when you go through a constructor. That's essentially what induction is. OK, so let's, let's try that proof again. OK, so n plus 0 equals n. We should be able to prove that. OK, so let's see. We'll do intro again. So now we have an arbitrary natural number n. We don't know anything about it. We have to prove that n plus 0 equals n. The cock has this tactic called induction. And that induction tactic will just use the induction principle that it generated automatically. Um, I could also just invoke the in induction principle directly just by using the apply tactic. That turns out to be the same thing. Um, so I want to do induction on n. So that gives me two cases. I have to prove the base case and then the, you know, the recursive case. Induction and recursion are the same thing. That's another um, byproduct of the Curry-Howard isomorphism. That's a pretty cool thing. I didn't know that when I was in computer science school, that you learn these two things in different classes, induction and recursion. Only later you find out, oh, I learned the same thing twice. OK, so in this first case, um, 0 plus 0 equals 0. That's pretty easy. So I'll use call by name to reduce it to just 0 equals 0. And then reflexivity solves the goal. So in the second case, this one's a little bit trickier. Um, again, I can use call by name. Um, this time, uh, the expression kind of just reassociates a little bit. And that's because that's what addition does. Um, and now I can, I can actually rewrite, um, let's see, this n plus 0 part of the, of the goal using that thing called IHN, which is the induction hypothesis. Um, we know that n plus 0 is equal to n. So let's, let's make use of that knowledge. Now I have uh, Sn equals Sn. That's the same thing, so reflexivity. Cool. So, okay. So that's like a slightly more complicated proof. Um, now this is this will be the the end um, of our proving adventure. So we just want to prove one more thing, just to get some practice with it. Um, I want to prove that addition is associative. So we saw this in the in the slide deck, but now we have the tools to understand it. Okay. So, um, so I, I mentioned before there was a tactic called intro, which moves the, you know. Um, Hypothesis above the line. Intros, plural, does it, but for all the hypotheses, so in this case, n, m, and p, these natural numbers. Now we, we have some arbitrary natural numbers. We just have to prove that this holds for those particular natural numbers. And I, when you just stare at this thing, you don't really know how to prove it. Well, it took me a few tries, but it turns out that just doing induction on n is the way to go. So you do induction on n. In fact, that, this is kind of a general point. Cock feels like a video game. You just kind of like try stuff sometimes um, for these simple things. Um, and in fact, you can you can build automation that that solves some like all these proofs could be solved very easily with some of the automation tactics that I haven't shown you yet. But I, you don't want to start with that. You want to learn how it actually works first, and then you use the tools to become a power user. Uh, okay, so. Um, what's going to happen here when I do call my name? Well, I have zero plus something, so it's just going to delete the zeros, right? That's what happens. OK, so we have reflexivity, so that case is easy. So the next case, OK, we have this thing. Um, it's just going to reassociate those parentheses on the left side, I think. 
And add some parentheses on the right side. If my understanding of addition is correct. Okay, and then the, well, we just got really lucky here. The induction hypothesis gives us exactly what we need. So this thing appears in the goal. And I can rewrite it to be, you know, the right-hand side of the equal sign. So now I have two things that are the same on both sides. So reflexivity again. Thank you, ED. Okay, so now we know for sure that addition is associative. They told us that in school, but how are we supposed to trust them? <laughs> uh, okay, so you might wonder, like, okay, you prove stuff in car, but then, like, what are you supposed to do? Just go re-implement it in a real programming language so you can run it in production? Um, well, you certainly could do that. Um, but then, you, you know, how do you trust that you implemented it correctly? So um, it turns out that you can actually just take Cock code and just produce Haskell from it. You can also produce the camel, but this is a Haskell meetup, so we'll do Haskell. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just import some modules here. So there's this thing you, you say um, extraction language, whatever extraction language Haskell in this case. I'm telling Cock I want to like make some Haskell code, but I have to tell Cock some more stuff about Haskell because Cock doesn't. I mean, it knows like you know how to do how to literally translate terms into Haskell, but it doesn't know about all the types like so. We have this type called bool in cock, and we're, we want to say it maps to an analogous type called bool in Haskell. And uh, that type bool has constructors true and false. So basically, I'm saying, like, I'm telling cock how to translate cock version of bool into Haskell version of bool. And this is, this is built in, so I didn't have to do it, but this just kind of illustrates the, the idea that sometimes, you know, with your, you don't, you don't want to, like, um, just do a naive translation, which is what Cock will do by default. Because, like, you know, if I translate that nat type into Haskell, it'll just generate an algebraic data type that's, you know, zero and successor. You'd never represent numbers that way in production. That's horrible, right? So instead, you do something like this. You'd say, uh, okay, so I'm going to represent nats by the integer type in Haskell, which is an arbitrary precision integer. Um, and you have to say basically what the constructors are, how the, how the Cock constructors map to Haskell. In this case, just the number zero and function plus one. Um, but since these constructors, at least the second one, takes arguments, you have to also provide uh, what is essentially a fold for your data type or a way to pattern match. So you have to tell Cock how to pattern match in Haskell on this data type. Um, so you just give it like a, a function that takes the cases as arguments. Okay, you can also say like, Everywhere I see plus in my cock code, I don't want to literally do recursion on the inductive structure of natural numbers because that's, you know, that takes like linear time and the size of the natural number, uh, which is the, just stupid. So instead, you just say, okay, I'm just going to translate this to the plus function in Haskell to make your code faster. Now, when you do this, it's kind of error prone because, um, you know, what's going to happen when we get to division, or you know, you have to think hard about. Um, partial functions and stuff. And then you could mess this up, and then your, your Haskell program would not be necessarily correct. So this, this is a part of the trusted thing. Like, um, you don't have to trust any of the proofs, because Cock will verify them for you. But you do have to trust this translation. OK, so let's write a simple program. Um, we don't need to dwell on what this program does. But it just takes a natural number, and it doubles it. Um, but it's also, um, I have this extra thing here. So this is the, this is the return type of this double function. You might wonder, why doesn't it just return a nat? And I, I could have done that, but I wanted to use depend types. <laughs> so this returns a special nat that is even. That's what this means. So whenever you double a number, you always get an even number as a result. And I can express that in cock using this. Um, so I get a, a natural number y such that even of y is true. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of cool. When you, when you write complicated programs in cock, you kind of sometimes you thread around these these extra proofs alongside with the program. Like the data and the proofs kind of flow together through your program. Um, and then, uh, OK, so now let's say I want to prove that this function is correct. How would I prove that? Well, one way to say it's correct is to say that if I double something, that's the same as adding it to itself. That's um, you know, it's always up to you to define what correctness means. That's kind of a, you know, it's, it's important that your definitions are right, too. Um, okay, so this is a this is a very easy proof. Uh, I'll just do some call by name reduction. There's this thing called omega. So omega is a really fancy tactic that can like do crazy things with numbers. It knows a lot about numbers. 
In this case, it knows that x times 2 is equal to x plus x. So it uses some uh, decision procedure algorithm to solve that, which is pretty cool. And as long as your goal just has like addition and multiplication and like basic arithmetic in it, it's uh, guaranteed to solve it if it's true. So that's pretty cool. That's, um, that's a tactic that you could bring yourself to part, but part of the standard library. Now, something interesting happens when I extract this double function that I've proven to be true. So, by the way, this is the Haskell that it spits out in the, uh, in the bottom. Okay, so you can see it's kind of a, it looks a little bit weird um, because, uh, let's see, I'm multiplying x by 0 plus 1 plus 1, which is 2. I'm just multiplying x by 2, that's what that's saying. Um, you know, you'd hope that GHC would uh, optimize that a bit. <laughs> um, but but uh, this thing actually, it kind of deleted some, some dependent types from my program. It deleted these proofs, which is what you want. You, you don't want the proofs in your program, you just want the program. Um, so that's, that's kind of what the magic of this extraction feature does. Um, it erases all the proofs. Um, you might know, how does it know what's a proof and what's not a proof? Because proofs live in a different universe. Um, so Kong has these different universes. So you have, you have the universe called set, which is where all your programs and data live. And you have a universe called prop, which is where your propositions live. And it deletes everything that's prop. So you're left with just pure Haskell. Um, OK, so that's how you do program extraction. And that, that, that was a very small example, but it's actually been used to extract a whole C compiler that's been proven to be correct. It's called the CompCert C compiler project. Um, so that's really cool. So you can imagine like writing a whole program in Kong, proving it correct, and then you just run it in production with GHC. That's program extraction. Um, that's the whole talk. So now you know how to prove some stuff in Kong. Um, that's really the whole language. That's like that's it. Um, you just have to imagine how to scale that up to like bigger proofs and stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> any questions? How would you do like negative numbers? <laughs> so you just have to find a representation of negative numbers. So maybe you store an extra boolean with your number. It's a sign bit or something. I see. Eventually, it all you know, it's, it's got to be an inductive data type or something, or a church encoding, or you might you have to find some functional way to represent it. Okay. Um, how do you so you want to do like verified C compiler? But how do you know what theorems to prove about that? So if I want to extract. Uh, my web service, right? I'm, a, I'm an application programmer. I want to extract a very fine web service from the proof in, in the Coq program. What programs do I prove about it? How do I know? So I, I think the approach that you generally take with these compiler correctness kind of things is you, you first have to define a semantics for the assembly language you're compiling to. And you also need a semantics for the high level language that you're compiling from. And then you prove that your program preserves those semantics as it goes through the compiler, like as it transforms through all these passes in the compiler. Um, so you need to define meaning, and then you have to prove that the meaning is preserved. But um, I don't have too much experience with that, so I can't go into any more depth. That's my understanding. So, I have more questions for Stefan. How, <clears throat> just curious, I mean, like the C compiler, I mean, how, how big is the proof? Like how many pages, how many lines of, uh, and how long does it take, did that actually, take to actually run it? Oh, I don't know, I've never tried. Okay. It's in a GitHub repo, I was taking a look at it this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a really impressive development, it's quite large. It's, I don't know, maybe 100,000 lines of code. Okay. Is there a proof of cock? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no so yeah, what is cock written in? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's written in OCaml. There's this thing called the, the girl and completeness theorem. And uh, you basically you can't, you can't prove cock is correct in cock. Cock is axial, you just trust it. Yeah, or you need like a fancier thing that you can prove cock in. Um, various parts of cock have, have been formalized, um, but we'll, we'll never have a complete proof. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the cock with the Agda? So, so Agda doesn't have Cock's uh, like tactic language. Um, Phil Wander recently wrote a book about um, proving stuff in Agda about um, and it's like analogous to Ben Pierce's Software Foundations book if you've seen that for Cock, but in Agda instead of Cock. Um, it turns out that this kind of actually surprised me, but Phil Wander found out that the proofs in Agda are actually about the same length as they were in Cock, even though Cock has automation and tactics and things that make it easier to write proofs. 
Um, so with Agda, I, I think the way that you write proofs is you use like typed holes. So you basically, you know, you, you leave a hole in your program and then the compiler says, okay, you need to construct a thing that has this type. And then you have to, you basically refine the goal like that. Um, Cog has a tactic called refine, which essentially does that. So it's, in Agda, if you write a proof, it's kind of like using the refine tactic over and over again in Cog. Um, is this this uh, book, the Programming Language Foundations in Agda? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. How relevant do you think the process and strategy of uh, you know writing proofs in that manner is applicable uh, to programming in other languages? Like Haskell, obviously, doesn't have dependent types, and there's a limit to what you can do. But in terms of actually I think what a lot of programmers, particularly functional programmers, might do is actually a similar behavior. You know, you start by writing a function, you write a type signature. I need to I need to write something from you know A to B, two things, and then you know subdividing that into well, I you know I know the type system. If I can have an A to C and a C to B, that's the same thing, and that people go through perhaps a similar process, like you were kind of saying earlier on, of, of breaking it into those helper functions and using those types to guide what you're doing. Do you think there's a lot that can be learned from the process of COP that's like transferable to even if you're just working in the language and not necessarily writing them in COP and generating them? Uh, that's very interesting. Um, I I think on some level, yes. Like like certainly some programs, you, you the types completely guide you through the implementation, especially um, for, for programs that you know like parametricity, like pre theorem. Like sometimes there's only one implementation that can possibly work. Like um, you have a pair of two things and you want to return the first thing. Um, or, I mean, sorry, if you have a type like pair A, B, and then returns A, there's only one way to possibly return that A. You have to extract it from the pair. And you can't do anything to it. The only thing about it. There's a talk um, about Idris um, from Edward Brady that um, he, he shows this really cool demo where um, his like Idris compiler thing can actually just write pretty sophisticated programs. Like it, he did a um, a demo where he it actually came up with a matrix multiplication algorithm, um, uh, just like on the fly. He didn't have to write anything, so that that was kind of amazing. Um, but I actually think that like going the other way, learning lessons from software engineering and bringing them into proof engineering is going to be a very fruitful thing. Like um, when you look at cock proofs that are written by academics, they tend to be very messy and uh, not not organized very well and not following software best practices. You know. Like, Things are not very modular. Yeah. Maybe they didn't set up Seattle board. Um, I think this is going to be like this is like a new way to do mathematics. And I think that the homotopy type theory book was written in this way. Um, started out as a cock development. Um, a lot of people were collaborating with it, and um, a lot of those people also had an experience uh, just writing programs, and they brought that to this development. So that I think is going to be a little bit more fruitful in that direction. I read, I read that uh, people actually verify uh, industrial code in Coke. And they, uh, well, so you kind of, you, you have to formulate, well, so that, was, that was my question. How do you formulate the theorems you want to prove about your code? So you showed an example where you prove that multiplication by two uh, has some property, uh, right? So. But uh, what if you know I want to have a web service? I want to have a compiler. I want to have I don't know what. What if I want to verify Spark, uh, right? So uh, that is a lot of work. But suppose I wanted to do that work. Uh, what is it that I formulate? So actually, it's not easy mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so some, I mean, you could you could imagine doing certain things like verifying that. Uh, type class laws hold, like uh, functor laws hold, monad laws hold. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can verify that your arrays always have the right bounds or something. Or, or that, you know, you, you, you have pointer manipulation and you never have a null pointer. Or something like that. So, but uh, what I read is that it's really a lot of work to make these proofs. So it's yeah. I think part of it is that 
propositions, right? In mathematics, they can, they can, they're very rich. Mm -hmm. But in programming languages, if they're types, we only have a small set of them, right? I mean, you have some parametric ones, but mostly you've got integer strings and double and arrays of something. And so what can you express using those types is not, you know, without dependent, with, with dependent types, it's a little richer, but with just those types, you can't really express it in the semantic content, right? You can't distinguish between a factorial function and a Fibonacci function because they both are proofs of int into int, right? Right. And so the type theory in programming languages has to get more sophisticated in order to be able to express things like certain kind of behavior, which is not just, you know, string into strings or a collection of intellection. So I think yeah. that's part of the issue. In some sense, dependent types are the end game. That's like, that's really it. You can already do arbitrary mathematics um, to the limit that mathematicians know how to do uh, in CAR. Um, so I think what remains now is we just have to make these tools easy to use. Because right now it's, it's just like, it took me years to get good at this. And I still, I still struggle with basic things all the time. So um, I don't know how we can expect industry programmers to just pick this up in their free time. Are you, on the job. Are you saying that the cock is able to do proofs of very specific theorems or more structural theorems? Like, I'm, I'm wondering, it can prove things like group theory, but can it actually talk about a, a particular group of order something and show the properties of that particular group? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Huh. Because I'm wondering how. Okay, all right, fine. I think we might have to cut off that. Anyway, yeah. So thank you very much, Stephen, for free. Yeah, I think you can talk to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> I agree to do this on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, it can be short and sweet if you like. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes break if anyone wants to run out, um, and then Chris is going to give a talk. Thanks very much for stepping in at the last minute when we had a, a late cancellation. Um, so we'll just set up quickly. Um, I assume you'll probably have everything you need to, yeah. to go.